the doors of the church are open. Get ready, Los Angeles, for a Holy Ghost explosion at Jesus is our Jubilee Church of God in Christ with television evangelist and pastor Elder Gerald Jones. The revival series never stops. You'll experience salvation, miracles, healings, breakthroughs, and deliverances at our new location and new service times, Sundays at 1.30 p.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. All services will take place at 1129 East Dominguez Street, Suite B in Carson, California, 90746, six blocks east of Ikea. Come expecting a miracle and come expecting a blessing. Share your praise reports on our 24-hour prayer line at toll-free 1-877-8-JUBILEE. That's 1-877-858-2453. For more information, call Pastor Jones today at 424-385-6035. That's 424-385-6035. Or visit us online at jesusjubileechurch.org. Hello, my name is Samuel Warren. You can look me up at www.samuelwarren, that's S-A-M-U-E-L-W-A-R-R-E-N.com. You can look me up there, and um, that explains who I am. I am a working casting director. A casting director is someone who casts talent for movies and commercials. But first, I'm a born-again Christian. I love the Lord. And uh, I've been sharing the scriptures and teaching the Bible for many, many years. Um, I'm going to be doing a trip to Israel in November, November the 4th through the 15th of this year. So if you want to come on that trip and visit the places where Jesus walked and the events of both the Old and New Testament, I would encourage you to get a hold of me, www.samuelwarren.com. When you go to the uh, website, look for Israel Tours, Israel Tours. Look for that on my website. My phone number is 01, which is the area code for the United States, area code for San Diego, 619-823-2378. We're going to be delving into the end of an era. Now, for the past several months, I've been dealing with Matthew 24, the Olive Discourse, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Now we're going to look at these passages with the looking at the book of Revelation chapter 19, 20, 21, and 22. So let's begin. Our lesson today is going to be coming from Isaiah, that's an Old Testament prophet, Isaiah chapter 61, and uh, Let's begin verses 1, and we will read until 6. Now, this event that's spoken about is really an end-time event that occurs somewhere at the end of the tribulation, not at the beginning. This is where after the Obama, there's there are seven years seven years within the tribulation. That is one era. The era in which we are living now is the time before the rapture. This is the era of the church. And when the rapture or the snatching away is what it really means, is taken by the believers at that time, there will be a beginning of a seven-year period. During this seven-year period, God will begin to deal on a more direct level with the children of Israel. Why? Because he wants the people, 
He wants the people of God that he had first called through Abraham because the Jewish people are the seed of Abraham. They're not the only seed. All right. But they are the seed through which the Messiah has come. So during this time, at the taking of the church, the rapture, which we don't know, it, it'll be suddenly, unexpectedly. Then the seven-year period will begin. The first half of the seven years is 1,260 days. The last half of the seven years is another 1,260 days. A total of, 70, uh, of, of, of seven weeks. And during this period of the seven period, Jesus, God the Father, will try to get his Jewish people to turn to him as a nation. It is the salvation not only of individuals or a group of individuals, but of a nation. That is what Yom Kippur is about. The Feast of Trumpets, which is before Yom Kippur, is the blowing. It is the gathering of the people. That's usually what it's for. The calling to war and the de declaration of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. After that event, we have a sacrifice, a time of judgment, which is Yom Kippur. It is a time which spells out a period of the last half of the tribulation. The middle part, which is the three and a half years, is the part declared on the model of Olives, uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. It is a declaration of the abomination of desolation. This is when the Antichrist decides to break his agreement, his seven-year agreement with letting the Jews build the temple, letting the Jews worship. He's going to come into the temple, into the holiness of holies, and de declare himself God. He's going to set up an image, and it's going to be an abomination. Because anytime you set anything up in the presence of God that's not of God and doesn't please or worship or honor God, that's an abomination. That's a, uh, a, a desecration. So during this last half of the seven years, the mid part, the Jews will re realize that they've been hoodwinked by a man that they thought was for them who's really not for them at all. And they will flee out of Jerusalem going down. When you go out of Jerusalem, you go down in the Judean desert. They will cross the Jordan River and they will flee to an area called Basra. Basra. Basra is also known in the Greek as Petra. So when they get from Basra, they're going to be in Petra. And Petra is known to at least house on the surface a million people. They have excavated some caves under that area and found that it can hold up to three or four million people, but they're still doing the excavation. At that time, when the Antichrist says he's God and wants to be worshiped and honored, the Jewish people who have believed in the, the, the coming of the Messiah See, they, at that point, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But at that time, they will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Now, remember, Joseph met with his brothers alone when they finally brought Benjamin. He had asked all the Egyptians to leave the room. They left the room, and you know what they did? They were with Jesus. I'm sorry. They were with Joseph, who is a type of Christ, alone. And Jesus will be alone with his Jewish brothers. Will it be in Basra or will it be before they flee? He will be alone with them and will reveal himself to them. And they that's when Zechariah says they will weep for, on him that they have pierced. They will look on him 
for they have pierced. They will weep as weeping for an only son. It says the men will weep separately from the Jewish women. This is typical in Orthodox teaching and belief system among the Jews, the Hasidic Jews, and some of the very Orthodox Jews. But it is not so much believed in the Reformed Judaism, which is a totally different picture. It would be as if you had different denominations. Well, they have different forms of Judaism for uh, in Judaism. Well, anyway, at the last half of the tribulation, just when it looks like Jerusalem is going to be destroyed because it will be run over by the Gentile nations and the Antichrist will put his tent on in the Mediterranean area. When he does that, guess what will happen? Christ will come back and fight for his Jewish people. Excuse me. He won't fight at the beginning of the tribulation. He won't fight at the middle of the tribulation. It will be at the very end. It'll be like another Red Sea a moment. You know, when the J Jewish people were at the Red Sea, the Red Sea was in front of them. It hadn't parted. And the Egyptians were behind them. So the Spirit of God that was hoovering and giving them light moved from front all the way to the back of them. So in front of them, they had light. But in back of them, there was complete darkness for the Egyptians, the enemy. During this time, Babylon's headquarters, the beast's city, will be in complete darkness. Think about it. The water will be blood. The plagues that they had will be going on. So all of these things will be happening that are evil, but they will continue. But the people are so bent on fighting the Jews. And then when they see Christ coming in the sky, it's going to be an awakening, a not so good awakening. It says the nations will mourn because they realize they're not prepared for Jesus. And when Jesus comes, the very person that they fought against, the very person that they took the mark against, because all of these people are still suffering from the sores, from the mark of the beast. These individuals, it says, will mourn. God says they, these individuals will mourn and they will not be ready. It will be too late. It's like when the policeman comes and you didn't do the right thing, you know you're going to be arrested. And it's going to be like that. Jesus is going to arrest mankind. But before we get to that part of the story, I'd like to start in Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from a New Living Translation for clarity's sake. It says, who is this who comes from Edom? That is the descendant person from each, from whom this territory belonged to. Edom happened to be committed to Esau, but we won't get into that. Who is this who have come from Edom? From the city of Basra. Petra is the modern name today, but it's still known as Basra. It is mentioned in Genesis and throughout the Old Testament. Here in Isaiah the prophet sees that this person is coming from Basra. They're coming from Petra. Basra is the area. Basra is the area that Jesus goes to fight at the beginning or the end of the tribulation. At the very end of the tribulation, the first battle Jesus deals with is Petra there in Jordan. It's about 70 miles or two-hour bus trip, if you ride the bus, from the, the, the Jordan River all the way to um, Petra. It always took us a two-hour bus drive. I don't know. It probably in the car, it's much faster. Who is this who has come from Edom, from the city of Basra, with his clothing stained in red? Who is this in royal robes? 
Who else would be in royal robes? Jesus of Nazareth. Who is in royal robes? Marching in his great strength. It is I. Look what Isaiah is saying, what the Lord is saying to him. It is I, the Lord announcing your salvation. Salvation is healing, deliverance, breakthroughs, okay? So God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, who is this? This is coming. It is I, the Lord, announcing your salvation. It is I, the Lord, who has the power to save. Why are your clothes so red? <laughs> Why are they so red? As if you have been treading out the grapes. It's a term or way of say, saying you have been slaughtering and killing and there's blood. It looks like grapes, red blood, red grapes on your vestibule, on your clothing. Verse three, I have been treading the wine press alone. So Jesus comes by himself to Basra to fight, all right? I have been treading the wine press alone. No one was there to help me. Now, the Bible talks about how the Antichrist will go after the children of Basra, the children of Israel who are staying in Basra, and fight. But Jesus is going to go there and fight for the Jews against the Antichrist, and it's going to be a bloodbath. No one was there to help me. He's by himself. Jesus is not with the angels. He's not with the church yet. He's, he's by himself fighting this war. As if they were grapes. In my fury, I trampled my foes. And their blood has stained my clothes. For the time has come for me to avenge my people. To ransom them from their oppressors. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. You and I are not supposed to do vengeance, okay? We watch our enemies, and we try to deal with them in a godly way. But we don't try to do vengeance on them because God has a time. Like he says here, it is time. For the time has come for me to avenge my people. Then he says, to ransom them from their oppressors. Who the oppressors, the Gentile nations, the people who are under the power and the authority of the Antichrist, the people who are doing the wrong thing. I was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. God goes on, I see that nobody is helping these Jewish people. I was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So I, myself, stepped in to save them with my strong arm, and my wrath sustained me. He was so angry that it gave him the motivation to fight. I It says, so I myself stepped in to save them with my strong arm, and my wrath sustained me. Verse 6, I crushed the nations in my anger and made them stagger and fall to the ground. Wow. That's something, isn't it? This is the warfare that's going to take place in Jordan. It talks about how Jordan is not even going to be under the authority of the Antichrist, but he's still going to come into that territory chasing the Jews. Jordan, if we were looking from the, the Jordan River, and we were looking where I'm looking at you, beyond you would be Petra. To the right would be the Dead Sea. And if you go all the way further, the Mediterranean area. So the Antichrist is going to have ships. He will probably ha have ways of coming in from the Mediterranean or into that desert area. And he will go all the way to Petra, but he will lose. Look what it says here. Look how it describes how Jesus, after he leaves Basria or Petra, he's going to come to Jerusalem with the saints. Revelation. 
This is Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21. Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and Jew, True, Faithful and Truth. Uh, Faithful and True is the title for Jesus. Then I saw heaven open. I saw a white horse standing there, but on the horse was a person by the name of Faithful and True. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. Verse 12 of chapter 19. His eyes were like flames of fire. You know, when you were a lot of probably a little child and mommy was angry, daddy was angry, that it looked like their eyes are really piercing. Well, his eyes, it says, will be like flames of fire. And on his head were many crowns, speaking of his authority as a king. Now, there's another passage in the sixth chapter of Revelation of someone that is also on a white horse. But his crown in the Greek is really a Stephanos. It is a victor's a wreath that you wear when someone wins in the Olympics. Not the same power. This person comes on a real white horse. You know, when Jesus was coming in to Jerusalem, we call it Palm Sunday, but it's really the presentation of the Lamb of God because the Lamb had to be presented four days before the death on the cross or the death on the spigot during Passover. So Jesus was there 14 days prior. He came in early because the lamb has to be observed. The lamb has to be in the home of the Jewish individual before they have Passover, the baby lamb. Well, Jesus was presenting himself to Jerusalem before he was killed. Well, he was riding, riding on a white donkey, which is the same kind of cult that... Um, Solomon rode on, all right? Solomon, when he was elected king by David, he rode on a, a colt, a white colt. Well, anyway, he comes on this white horse. He has many crowns, and it says, a name was written on him that no one understood except himself. This is a name of honor. You are only open to what it personally means to you. That's what they did in the ancient Roman times. It was so special. It was an envelope that you'd open up or a white stone on it with your name on it with its meaning that was only revealed to you. Very fascinating. He wore a robe. Let me read that again. A name was written on it on him. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He's going to have a tattoo, an image that has his name on it that only Yeshua HaMashiach is going to know the meaning of. That's a personal thing that God the Father has given to the Son. He wore a robe dipped in blood. And his title was the word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. Here's the picture. He's already done business in Basra. He comes back this time on a white horse. He's got a crown, many crowns on him. He's got a name tattooed on him that only he knows the meaning of. And then behind him is the armies of heaven. A lot of you have seen that, those paintings and pictures of Jesus riding on a white horse coming out of the sky, coming out of the clouds, and behind him is an army. This is that depiction. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God. 14. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure, pure white linen followed him on a white horse. 15. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. Out of his, He just spoke the word. You know, when you are walking in the will of God and you're walking in authority, you can speak the word and element. Things change because you're speaking as the oracles of God. You know, the Bible says speak as the oracles of God. Speak according to the will of God and what you say will happen. But you got to be living right. You got to be living under the will of God. You got to be uh, sanctified by being true to God. Doesn't mean you're perfect. You are complete. The word for perfect in the scriptures is be perfect. It really means be complete. Well, the only way you and I can be complete is to have Christ in our life because now we have the image maker who we are part of guiding and teaching us. Do you understand? Anyway, from his mouth came a, came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. The nations will be humbled through the words that Jesus will speak. He will rule them with a rod of iron, meaning that when he comes, he will. it will be the end of an era. Two eras have ended. The first era of the church, the second era of the Gentile nations, and the third era, which is the era of the thousand-year millennium where Christ will rule with an, uh, 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 a rod of iron, that will begin for a thousand years. He will release the, let me go back, verse 15. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. That's not good. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This rod, this rod is iron and it doesn't comfort. It corrects. All right, get the idea? He will release the feast, feels, I'm sorry. He will release the fierce wrath of God. God who? Father. The Almighty. Like juice flowing from a wine press. That means the blood is just going to be so much. On his robe at his thighs was written this title, King of all kings, or King of kings, and Lord of all lords, or Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures, flying high in the sky, come, gather together for the great Banquet God has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, strong warriors of horses and their robes and of all humanity, both free and slave, small and great. I'm reading that's verse 17 going to 18. I'm going to read a little bit more on the night. 19. Then I saw the beast and the king of the world. And their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his armies. And the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who accepted the mark of the beast, who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and the false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse and the vultures all gorged themselves on the dead bodies. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson for today. Thank you.